Hey everyone, thanks for joining me on another episode of Theory to Practice. This is episode three, uh, Implied Volatility. In today's talk, I'm going to go over a brief introduction where I'll introduce myself for those who don't know me. We'll discuss a code overview, show the project that we've been working on and how we're going to add to it today. We'll next dis discuss implied volatility, uh, what that means, what affects it, and then we'll jump into Quant Connect code to see how we can implement that for your code if you're on Quant Connect. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Benjamin George. I have a PhD in aerospace engineering. During the day, I process data and hardware tests for a defense contractor, and at night, I'm a, a quant. I've only been doing this for a year now, since January 2023. It's flown by, uh, but I'm excited to grow and learn with you. My primary platform is Python on Quant Connect. As I was uh, thinking about the goal for my talk, I really was thinking I want to inspire you. I was recently reading this book by Walter Isaacson on Elon Musk, and he and Musk talks about how a maniacal sense of urgency is is his operating principle. That's what's given him a, a, so much of his success over the years. Now, granted, it's probably also contributed to all three of his divorces. But, but you know, looking at his life, is there something that you can take away? Is there some way that you can incorporate a maniacal sense of urgency as you're developing in your quant finance journey? In this next slide, I talk about the, the code overview. So to remind you, the, the objective of our code is to create an algorithm to implement covered call strategies to reduce the cost basis and generate income. We start with the, the Magnificent Seven uh, universe. So this is Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Tesla. We take the price data for those stocks in the universe and we create what we call an alpha model. This is our secret sauce. This is where we put in all of our uh, data processing. So from the previous talk, we know that we took the current price and calculated the simple moving average for the last 100 days. And when the current price was less than the 100-day SMA, we created a trade signal that basically told the code to send out a market order to buy 100 shares and sell a 25 delta call option with at least 10 days to expiration. Oh, just to, to remind you, the previous two talks, the one on 516 talks about the SMA, and then the talk from last week talks about how I implemented uh, selling that covered call. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to, to talk about the implied volatility rank and basically use IVR as a metric to determine when to buy our shares and sell our covered call. So before we jump into IVR, we need to talk about what implied volatility is. Implied volatility is basically a forecast of the magnitude of the underlying security price movement based on the option price. It's basically the market's view on what the volatility of the underlying security is going to be. Typically, how we calculate that is you take the option price, the time to expiration, the underlying stock price, the strike price of the option you're looking at, the historical volatility, and the risk-free rate. And you, you combine all that together and you uh, put it into your option price model. One of the most common option price models is the, the Black-Scholes model. And then you iteratively calculate what the implied volatility is going to be. Now, the great thing about implied volatility is that it's forward-looking. It's a prediction, granted, of questionable accuracy. But a prediction, nonetheless, that can be compared to the historical volatility, which looks at the past price movement. So we can compare how does the previous historical volatility compare to the implied volatility that's basically being dictated by the option price or how the option price is changing. Now, what are some of the factors that affect the implied volatility? Uh, we look at macroeconomic indicators. We can talk about news, earnings reports, both positive and negative. Anything that changes the value of the underlying security and the derivative, which is the option, that's what's going to change the IV. Now, to give you some trends, the near-term options have a higher IV typically than the long-term options um, because when you look at IV, the uncertainty associated with IV when it is compressed to a, a shorter duration like it is in a near-term option, it's going to be worth more than when you have that duration spread over a longer time period like you do for a long-term option. One of the things that we look at is we want to compare the implied volatility to the uh, historical volatility to estimate maybe there is some discrepancy between the two. Maybe the implied volatility right now is much higher than the historical volatility. And that, and that may indicate that the, the current option may be overvalued. And that's what we want to do, right? As traders, we want to sell things, securities and options that are overvalued and buy them back when they become accurately priced. So this strategy is looking to sell a call when it's at its most profitable, aka when an IV is high. So next, we'll take a look at some of the implied volatility metrics. Honestly, you know, some people look at the absolute value of the implied volatility, but what I'm going to talk about today is the relative measure of the implied volatility, comparing the current implied volatility to the implied volatility of the past. 
There are two metrics I want to look at. The first one is going to be the implied volatility percentile. It's a percentage that the current IV was below the previous IV levels. This is the equation, the implied volatility percentile. And we're going to look at kind of like a daily time period. So this number of days where the implied volatility was below the current IV divided by the number of trading days times 100. So 90% IVP indicates that during this time period, if you're looking at the last 52 weeks or whatever it may be, maybe you're looking at the last 252 days. So you're looking at the last you know year. The previous IV was below the current IV for 90% of the time. Meaning right now, the IV is very high compared to the previous you know, number of trading days. The, the downside to using the implied volatility percentile is that you need to know the previous IV for the last number of trading days. You need to know what the IV was for the last 252 trading days if you're looking at it like on an annual basis. But the good thing is that as you're adding more and more data points, you're weighing them equally. So you have a much smoother curve of the IV extremes or rapid changes in the IV won't continue, won't create these discontinuities when you're tracking IVP. You know, it's not going to be as noisy as what we're going to see in this next slide when we look at the implied volatility rank. Implied volatility rank is basically the current IV relative to the high and the low IV during our defined period. So again, we're going to look at the last 52 weeks. And the IVR is equal to the current IV minus the 52-week low divided by the 52-week high minus the 52-week low. So what does that mean? It means that basically when the IVR is 50%, the current IV is halfway between the high and the low IV. So the great thing about this is that we only need to keep track of the high and the low IV. And the downside is that large changes in IV will result in large changes to the IVR. So on one hand, you're going to be able to see quite drastically changes when, for instance, IV changes rapidly, like let's just say it's before earnings reports, you'll see a large change in the IV. That change is going to be much more distinct when you look at the IVR relative to the IVP. The downside is that it may cause discontinuities in your IV if you're tracking IVR as a function of time. And, you know, discontinuities, harder to detect a trend, if you will. So now that we've talked about the two metrics, I want to jump into QuantConnect here, and we're going to talk about how to implement IVR in the QuantConnect code. Just a reminder, I don't have any affiliation with QuantConnect, but they did give me a credit once, and I really like their service. I've been using it for a while, but we're going to jump into the code. Okay, great. So just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over the parts that I've covered in the previous talk. They're on the Quantopian community, but just to give you a, a brief overview, we set our start end dates, we set our underlying cache, we talk about our tickers, uh, we initialize variables here. Now, the, the, the variables I want to talk about that we're going to use in particular is the current IV. We're going to have a dictionary for that. We're going to have a dictionary to keep track of the 52-week low. We're going to have a dictionary to keep track of the 52-week high IV. We're going to have a value for the, the mid value of that 52-week low, and then a max value for that 52-week high. So again, we're keeping track of the high IV, the daily low IV, the max of that low IV dictionary, and the max of the high IV. Here, we do some work here. Check out the previous code where we're talking about how we set our options filter in QuantConnect. Here, I'm basically initializing these dictionaries. The key is going to be the ticker, and then the value for my dictionary is basically going to be the high IV and the low IV as a list. So what would I expect for this 52 week low if I was tracking for the last 252 days, I would expect this to be around 252 in length. And this one's gonna be at 252 in length. And then this one is basically gonna be two in length. It's gonna be the daily low IV. And this is gonna be the daily high IV list. It's gonna be a list. And then, what, what these are going to be, these are going to be singular values. So this is going to be a min value, and this is going to be a max value. And here, this is just a function, and this function basically is used, we'll see it down below, and this is to take the, the, the current IV and check to see if it changes the upper and lower bounds of our IV dictionary. We'll get to that in a minute. So if you remember from QuantConnect, we have our on data, and this is where we get our trade bars. So I have a for loop that's iterating through all of our Magnificent 7 tickers, as I have displayed up here. And so what we look for initially is we look to see if the market's open. If it's not, we just keep iterating and waiting for the market to open. Then we check to see if we can get a trade bar based on the ticker. So for instance, if we're looking at Google, this ticker would be G-O-O-G. -O -O then we would look at get the option chain for Google, Goog. And then if that option changed none, we just keep iterating through. 
what we're doing here with this sorted is I'm looking for the at the money contract. So, so what this is looking for is the at the money contract. And what I'm going to assume, at least in my code, is that the option expiring, that's basically the option that is at the money and with the closest expiration is going to be the most accurately priced. And if it's the most accurately priced, then I'm going to get the most accurate measure of the implied volatility. Now, whether that's true or false, there needs to be some research on that, but that's going to be my assumption for this. So here, basically, I'm trying to see, to trying to find the option where the underlying price is closest to the strike price of the option, I'm trying to sort by the expiration date. Uh, you can sort here by the call or the put. So here I'm checking to make sure that I haven't sorted out all the contracts. If I have, then I'll keep returning. If I haven't, then I'll basically get the first option in that contract list, which should be the at the money option with the nearest expiration based on my sorting. If my current IV dictionary is empty for that ticker, so maybe it's the first trade bar or the first options chain, I want to fill it up first. So I basically I'll use the current IV and then use that as the first two values, both the min and the max value for my current IV dictionary. If it's not, so let's just say it's been a new trade bar, what I'll get is I'll get the current IV low, I'll get the current IV high, so maybe it's like midday and I have a low and a high daily IV value that I've kept track of throughout the day. And what I'll say is, is the current value less than the lowest value in my list? If it is, replace the lowest value with this new lower value. And then I'll check to see if the current IV is greater than the, the high value. If it is, replace my upper bound with this current IV. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out as you know this data is, is coming by minute by minute or second by second, whatever it may be, I'm trying to keep track of the, the high IV for the day and the low IV for the day. And then here, I'm basically just calculating the IVR. I'm making sure that I actually have a value for the min and max of the IV. And then uh, calculating, this is just the equation that, that I showed in the previous slide. This part over here, I'm not going to go over. You know, we talked about it previously. I'm just going to show that I basically added a new condition to my if statement, checking to see that the IVR is greater than 30. And this is where I would basically buy 100 shares, sell a covered call. And then on market close, I basically sell 100 shares and buy back my option. Here, what I'm doing is I'm basically keeping track of the IV for the last 52 weeks. So what I have is if the dictionary value is greater than 52 times five or 270 days, or actually, I guess I should have put up here. This is uh, 270 in length, not 252. So basically, if it has already been 270 days, I'm going to pop off the, the first value, which is going to be the oldest IV value before I add on or append my new daily high and low. Here, I'm basically just calculating the max and min value of these two dictionaries per the ticker. This last part here is basically just a plotting feature that I added. I wanted to show in the back test how the IV changes as a function of time. So basically, I'm just calculating the average of the, the current IV high and the low, getting that value, and then just tracking that as a function of the, the high and low throughout the, the year and plotting it. And then I basically reset the current IV dictionary at the end of the day. Because basically, this aftermarket close, based on my function here, uh, basically runs one minute after the Google trading period ends, it runs this function. Okay, let's run into the, the back test. So here I basically run into the back test. I've run this for about a month. And what you can see here is basically the portfolio returns about negative 0.1%. But what I want to show you is we're going to plot the IVR, click on this. And what we can see here is that Google as a function of time, you can see that the IVR goes to be about 25. I know it's hard to see with this, but it's basically at this 25 level and then increases on January 21st to an average of about 93. So you're seeing the IVR change as a function of time. But this is basically the IVR for the whole day. What I'm keeping track of is the IVR basically minute by minute, because that's what I'm looking at. So here, what I've done is I've basically told it to log when the IVR is greater than 30. So basically at 113.940, the IVR for Microsoft was 33. And so I bought 100 shares and I sold a covered call. And then the next day, IVR for NVIDIA was 39. And so I bought 100 shares, sold a covered call. And you can see that that happened in the order. So I know this is a lot to take in. I really try to give you a lot to look at. I'm going to post this code on the Quant Connect forum where you can just download it and you can actually change some stuff yourself. So I'm going to stop sharing here and actually go back to my slides where I'm going to talk about some of the improvements that I could have made 
Now, for instance, looking over a month, I'm not necessarily looking at how the historical volatility has changed. In fact, when I'm starting, I start at 1-1. I don't even do a history call for the last, you know, 252 days of implied volatility. So really what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the implied volatility starting from today and, and basically saying, using that as a, a starting point for tracking. So what I'm going to show next time in our talk is how to do a history call. And basically using a history call, I can get the IV for the last 252 days. That way, the first day I'm trading, I'm already incorporated all the IV information from the past, let's just say, year. Some other things I'm going to show later on is uh, how to incorporate different options. We'll look at different indicators. We'll talk about it, automated universes, all this good stuff. With that, I want to end my talk and also leave time for questions. So thank you so much for showing up, and I appreciate your time.